Thank you very, very much indeed for this uh, very nice introduction. I have to say that I, I feel the vibrant mood that is the mood of the Hertie School of uh, Governance. It's very impressive, and I'm proud to have the scarf I was given. <laughs> I have also to say that I was impressed by what I could see as regards the interviews that we have put on, on the website and uh, the concepts that were elaborated by the, by the students here. Uh, let me say that I, uh, as has just been said a moment ago, been asked to share with you some reflections on European governance. And uh, I have to say that uh, I would like to replace this uh, European experience that we have today and which is demanding in a more general context of the global phenomenon of adaptation to the new global economy and the new world in which we are. I have experienced myself since uh, the beginning of the 80s a series of phenomena that were uh, not perceived by the advanced economy as a major crisis, but I know that I'm speaking in front of a very important uh, grouping of students that are coming from emerging economies. And uh, for those economies, of course, it was the major crisis that you can imagine. Latin America in the 80s, with all Latin America countries being in great difficulty, uh, only one country in Latin America did not default at the time, but all the others did. And we had also Africa in a very, very difficult situation. We had the Middle East, uh, Egypt at the end of the 80s, practically entire continents were in a very, very difficult situation. Latin America, Africa, uh, the Middle East, the eastern part of Europe, including, of course, uh, Poland, which had started to be in great difficulty at the beginning of the 80s, and then Soviet Union. Soviet Union, which uh, defaulted and, uh, of course, exploded at the end of, uh, of the 80s, the beginning of the 90s. At that time, I draw your attention to the fact that there was some kind of common belief, very naive common belief, according to which the Asian countries that were particularly well managed would not experience the dramatic experience of entire continents, as I just said. And of course, it went without saying that the advanced economy uh, could not have such problems for a number of reasons, including the fact that they had invented themselves the industrial, industrial society, that they had invented market economies, and that they knew better how to manage their own finance and their own economy. We discovered that it was a naive belief as regards uh, Asia at the end of the 90s, and we had the Asian crisis. And I guess that a, a number of us know what it means, uh, the Asian crisis, because they are coming from uh, those countries. And then at the end of the Asian crisis, the idea uh, was, uh, again, the very naive belief that the advanced economy could not be touched. So that now that all emerging economies, or practically all emerging economies, had corrected their own trajectory, had been called to adjust and manage much better their finance and their macro policies, uh, there was no problem anymore. And I have to mention that uh, it was the consensus of the international community at the beginning of the uh, 2000s uh, until the start of the present crisis, that there was absolutely no need for helping any country in the world. The idea was the private sector stands ready to finance any country which could have any problem. And it was so such a, a joint belief of the international community that the successive managing director of the IMF were told by their main shareholders uh, please dismantle your landing wing. We need, of course, the uh, 
part of the IMF which is devoted to surveillance. The surveillance wing is more important than ever, but the lending wing is uh, of no use because the private sector is financing the advanced economy. We discovered, of course, after 07, 08, 09, that it was much more complex than that, and that uh, uh, it was, in a way, the turn of the advanced economy to experience this kind of adjustment. And it came first, you might remember, with the very, very impressive crisis of global finance. I will give you a second uh, grid to read what's happening today. The first one is, again, at the global level, at the level of the planet, over the last 30 years or 35 years, a phenomenon of adaptation at the level of the entire globe. Now, inside the, uh, I would say, more particular constituency of the advanced economy, you have, in my opinion, three episodes since the start of the crisis. We knew ourselves in the ECB, my colleagues and I, we knew when the crisis really started for us. It was the 9th of August 2007. Then we had the uh, very sharp, very abrupt change of the uh, functioning of our money market, a disruption of our money market. Our interest rates at the time were at the level of 4.25%, but the market was not functioning at all. And we decided to embark into, on a, a very, very important non-standard measure, which was the supply of liquidity on an unlimited basis at fixed rate. Uh, you might remember that it, it, we were asked by the banks to supply 95 billion euros, which was an enormous amount of money. Uh, it went quite correctly, and we diminished, of course, the supply of liquidity with time, and we went out of this uh, crisis, intense crisis period, quite rapidly after several days. Then it appeared that all the advanced economy had engaged in what I would call a period, an episode of financial turbulences, which last a certain period of time for, from um, the August 2007 up to the collapse of Lehman Brothers. First episode, epicenter of the crisis in the United States of America because it was the uh, subprime and the disruption of the mortgage market and the subprime market which had created these financial turbulences. Then we had a second episode, the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the very, very abrupt and sharp contagion that was observed the world over quasi uh, immediately. I have to mention the fact that this is something which we have to understand better even now. Uh, a lot of academic research is necessary to understand better why and how a single event in one particular country, relatively modest in its own dimension, could have such consequences at the global level. It triggered the grave and immediate threat of a collapse of all financial institutions in the advanced economy and even the world over, and it triggered a free fall of the real economy. We had to cope with this situation, and uh, I have to say the central banks on the one hand uh, that are uh, called uh, in such circumstances to be as lucid as possible, to make a judgment as right as possible, and take a number of measures. We are on the front line, but of course uh, the central bank can deal with li some liquidity problem. They cannot deal with the uh, problems that would involve the taxpayer risk and the taxpayer engagement, the taxpayer commitment, which was also the case. And uh, the advanced economy succeeded in arresting progressively the immense tsunami that was threatening, uh, again, the financial economy the world over and the real economy the world over. We didn't have the Great Depression, very Great Depression, which was threatening the world because of these uh, measures. But we had a Great Depression, as you know, all over the world. And uh, I have to say that uh, because we avoided 
a total catastrophe, we have a tendency to forget the gravity of the threat that uh, we all had to cope with. I don't want to stress what was done by governments, but I would like to say just a few words on what was said by what was done by the uh, central banks, and particularly, of course, by, by the ECB on this, uh, uh, across this exceptional, exceptionally demanding period of time. We embark in, as I said, non-standard measures. And uh, the main non-standard measures in, the, in Europe was this supply of liquidity I already mentioned on an unlimited basis, uh, provided, of course, appropriate collateral would be given at different duration and at fixed rates. In the United States of America, if I concentrate on comparing the two sides of the Atlantic, you have seen that the main non-standard measures was the outright purchases of securities. And this, of course, characterizes uh, two very different non-standard measures. To understand uh, better why we had uh, engaged in very different non-standard measures, you have to know that uh, the European economy is financed mainly through commercial banks, and that uh, the proportion might be uh, 75 to 80 percent of the financing in normal times of the financing of the European economy through banks, and the rest of it through other means, including markets. In the United States of America, it is exactly the contrary. The markets are financing uh, 75 to 80 percent of the economy, and uh, the banks uh, are financing the rest of it, which is, uh, say, something like 20 percent. Uh, at least it is the order of magnitude. Uh, that explains why the main danger for the U.S. was the uh, seizing up of markets. Uh, the interruption of the normal functioning of market is uh, the total catastrophe. For us, the main danger was the interruption of the functioning of the banks, because, again, they are financing 80 percent of the European finance. And then you understand why, for us, it was the illimited supply of liquidity to banks that was the main tool that we utilized. And uh, for the U.S., again, as I said, the outright purchases of securities. But that being said, we had a different concept. Uh, and I would like to elaborate just a, a little bit on the European concept of the non-standard measure. We since the very beginning, considered that our non-standard measure were delivered, were decided to counter abnormal functioning of markets, disruption of markets, abnormal functioning of markets, and that they, were, they had to be commensurate to the difficulty to have an appropriate transmission of our monetary policy decisions. We considered that uh, the standard measures, namely the interest rates, what I would call the normal monetary policy decisions, the standard monetary policy decisions, had to be designed to deliver price stability over time, in the medium term, as, you, as we say, and in line with our definition of price stability, that you know, less than 2%, close to 2%. So we considered since the very beginning that there was a separation principle between the standard measures and the non-standard measures. And we could then increase or decrease interest rates of the standard measure in order to be sure that we would deliver price stability over the medium term in line with our definition when the non-standard measures would be decoupled from the standard measures and again be commensurate to the disruption of market and the difficulty to transmit our monetary policy standard decisions to the real economy. In another conception, you consider that the non-standard measure are the continuation of standard measures when you are at a zero interest rate level. And that, that is a, a conception, a concept uh, that uh, is uh, different. And uh, I have to say that as far as uh, the uh, European are concerned, uh, we, we consider that uh, uh, taking into account the European uh, uh, environment, taking into account the challenges that we have to cope with, it, is, it was and it is uh, very important that this separation principle would be respected. I do not want to elaborate uh, much more on the uh, 
standard measures and non-standard measures that uh, we have taken. Uh, what I would note is that uh, with this uh, uh, attachment that we always had to respect fully our mandate of price stability, and I am in Berlin, I know how important it is uh, here, but in all other countries. Uh, I have to say that the citizens of Europe are extremely attached to price stability and uh, extremely attached to price stability as has been uh, defined because it was in the continuity of what had been uh, decided upon in a large number of countries. This less than 2%, but close to 2%, definition of price stability uh, was in the continuity of uh, what had been done or observed in the years, in the run-up to the euro. I would like, and you will not be surprised that the previous former president of the Central Bank would say that, when I look at the results of the policy that we have pursued, my predecessor and myself and Mario now, I have to tell you that the figures are quite convincing. We have delivered price stability over the first 13 years of the euro at the level of 2.03%, which is a little bit different from the less than two, but close to two that I have uh, mentioned already, but taking into account that we had to go through a number of uh, shocks, including oil shocks, it is something which is really very, very impressive in terms of uh, uh, delivering price stability. I also have to say, and it is also impressive, that when you extract from the markets the uh, uh, inflation expectations for the next 10 years and take into account the appropriate risk premium and so forth, you arrive to a sentiment of the market uh, participants and also of the panels that we will deliver price stability equally over the next 10 years with a, a, a inflation as an average yearly inflation of something like 1.9%. So 2% over the first 13 years, 1.9 perhaps over the next 10 years for the track record and for the present anticipation it means that over a quarter of a century, the euro would have delivered and will deliver in the anticipation of the market's price stability in a remarkable fashion, I have to say. And speaking in Germany, I would uh, mention that in Germany, the national inflation has been since the setting up of the euro of something like 1.6% when you make all computation and uh, uh, you have the yearly average inflation let me mention that when I compare this stability in this country and in the euro area as a whole, I already mentioned, when I compared with what was done before the euro, I recomputed the overall average yearly inflation from year 55 to the end of 98, before the euro, and I arrived to something like 2.9% for this country. So the euro has delivered a price stability which in terms of long, relatively long historical period is absolutely remarkable. And I wanted to make that point, if you permit me, because, because we were given... Uh, my colleagues uh, of uh, the governing council, Wim Duisenberg, Mario Draghi, myself, we were given that mandate. And uh, uh, in the currency union, in the monetary union, I trust really that we delivered. So I don't want to be complacent. And we should never be complacent. EMU is not only a monetary union, it's an economic and monetary union. So it has a, the monetary union component with a clear mandate of price stability, and it has an economic component, the economic union. So what happened with the economic union? And uh, I have to say, to sum up the, my present di diagnosis, we, I have to say that we had two major problems. Before the crisis, 
before the crisis. One was the absence of full respect of the Stability and Growth Pact, which has been something very grave, because the Stability and Growth Pact was really the main, the core, the main element of the economic governance, and very unfortunately, at a certain moment, major countries in Europe, uh, including my own country, including Germany, including Italy, decided that it was not to be applied fully for them. And of course, it had a lot of consequences, not only in terms of destabilization of the economic governance, but also in terms of uh, demolishing, if I may, the spirit of the uh, Stability and Growth Pact and uh, the uh, understanding that because we had a monetary union, it was absolutely necessary to be strict on the uh, surveillance and on the monitoring of the economic union. There was a second point which uh, we have to understand fully also and uh, which uh, was uh, clear before the crisis. And that second point was that there was no sufficient surveillance or even no surveillance with sanction of the competitive indicators inside the euro area, of the imbalances inside the euro area, and of the combination of loss of competitiveness and uh, in increase of imbalances. And uh, I have to say that the ECB was uh, very, very clear uh, to say, well, we should introduce this element of monitoring, surveillance, and governance of the nominal evolution inside the euro area, because, again, we are in a single currency, very large economy, an economy which has the size of the United States of America. We know that we deliver price stability. We are credible in delivering price stability over time, so there is a benchmark for uh, the nominal evolution of uh, uh, all costs and prices in the member countries of the euro area, and that benchmark is that all taken into account, we deliver an inflation at the level of the entire continent, which is in line with our definition of price stability. So, as you see, before the crisis, two elements appeared very clearly. After the crisis, I have to say that we had not only the full confirmation that these two first weaknesses had to be corrected, and had to be corrected immediately, reinforcing formidably the Stability and Growth Pact, reversing the burden of the proof, and so forth. And I don't uh, elaborate on that, but this is part of the six packs which have been decided by the European, and it's a very, very important part of the new governance which has been set up. There was also the recognition that the surveillance of uh, these imbalances, the surveillance of competitive indicators, w should be fully part of the uh, overall uh, governance of Europe. And we, in the six packs, we have also this particular introduction of this uh, surveillance pillar. Now, we discovered also uh, that uh, because these were, were simple confirmation, at least in the eyes of the governing council of the ECB. But we also discovered that we had a crisis management which had to be set up uh, uh, in, uh, I would say, this extraordinary occasion, which was the worst financial crisis since World War II. And I have to say that... Uh, we also discovered, in my, in my opinion, that we had to consider right now to go further in the direction of improving governance in Europe, and that in the euro area in particular, and that we could not leave, we could not leave with the, only the present concepts, in, even if we had a crisis management which would be commensurate uh, to the difficulty that we, we have to cope with in this uh, uh, episode of the crisis. And uh, let me elaborate uh, uh, rapidly in a few minutes on one possible idea. I already uh, said that we probably will need a Ministry of Finance and a Minister of Finance of the Euro area. 
I uh, would say that he could have in my sentiment the responsibility of uh, the surveillance of the financial sector at the level of uh, the uh, area as a whole. He would uh, certainly have the, a lot of responsibility, uh, of international responsibility, of course, a lot of responsibility in making the surveillance of the fiscal policies and of the economic policies in general in line with the necessity uh, to have sound behavior for both, and not only for the budget, but also for the nominal evolutions of prices and costs I have already mentioned. I also trust that it would be appropriate, and I already made uh, this uh, proposal, that instead of activating the sanctions, which are presently the fines, when there are a number of anomalies that are not corrected by a particular country, as you know, you make recommendations. If the recommendations, uh, uh, of course, uh, within a certain very, very uh, def well-defined uh, decision-making process, when the, these recommendations are not implemented, there is the possibility of imposing fines. Instead of that, it seems to me that it would not be inappropriate to consider that we could have, in those cases, the activation of some kind of federation, I would say economic and fiscal federation by exception. So that if a country behaves very improperly and creates a problem for all other, because it is a grave and immediate threat for the stability of the system as a whole, of the euro area as a whole, instead of embarking on fines that are not necessarily the best way to organize the, the euro area, we could have the activation again of decisions at the level of the center. And some decisions could be taken on, upon proposal of the commission with the approval of the council, and of course it could be one of the major responsibilities of the so-called Minister of Finance of, of the euro area, and then, in order to be sure that the process is fully democratic, you will have a vote by the European Parliament. So the European Parliament, the representative of the people of Europe that are elected, as you, we all know, by universal uh, polling, would make their own judgment, measure whether or not they consider themselves the representative of the people, that the stability of the entire continent is at stake, and if it is the case, then they would give their approval. And it would be natural then that uh, decisions that are taken at the center are immediately to be implemented because, again, we would have activated with all the appropriate precaution that kind of federation, uh, economic and fiscal federation by exception that was man mentioning. Of course, it should be very targeted, very uh, concentrated on some issues that are considered uh, essential. Subsidiarity is inbuilt in this mechanism because it's not at all the normal way you operate. It's only in very exceptional cases and when you consider, and when the European Parliament himself considered that there is an immediate and grave danger. And of course, we will have to introduce, in this, if the, such a concept is examined, we'll have to introduce the appropriate connection with the national authorities, the appropriate enlightenment uh, of the European Parliament himself by the national parliament uh, involved. I think that, again, we have to reflect more on that. But my sentiment, and uh, I give uh, my sentiment very candidly, very simply, my sentiment is that we certainly have to go further, to go further than the present six packs, again, which are themselves an immense progress in comparison with what existed before, but are not necessarily yet, and it is normal because we are working in real time and the, the lessons of the present crisis have to be drawn in real time. I do not want to elaborate more on that, but I think that we can have a lot, and I can have a lot of arguments demonstrating that we can be very, very cautious. It could be a clear, clearly democratic process because I really trust 
that the democratic accountability of all those decisions, of course, is absolutely essential. And uh, my own understanding is that the European Parliament is ideally placed to play that role. And uh, uh, when uh, it was decided to have uh, uh, the election of the MPs at the level of the European Parliament by universal polling, of course, it was clearly what uh, one could have in mind. Now, let me conclude. I do not forget, even if I concentrated a little bit on Europe, that uh, we have in front of us uh, uh, graduates that uh, are coming from the entire world, that are young, energetic, able to cheer <laughs> extremely well, as we could uh, see a moment ago. I only wanted to tell them, prepare yourself in your careers for extraordinary events, extraordinary events. If I take my own case, I have had several times the sentiment to experience things that were unthinkable before, unthinkable for me and perhaps unthinkable for uh, the consensus, if I may, of the international community. I don't want to insist too much on the fact that we are here in Berlin and I was in Berlin myself in the time of the war. I, I, I went in the eastern part, you know, and uh, I uh, could compare the east and the west. And at that time, I have to say, we <laughs> considered that it was uh, very sadly uh, the way things uh, were going. And the idea that I would enjoy a vibrant <laughs> Berlin, as I see it today, is something which is, in a way, something extraordinary. I have a lot of other things like that. I, I negotiated with, when I was president of the Paris Club, with uh, uh, President Borga Gorbachev, uh, the rescheduling of the Soviet Union debt. Uh, the, the Soviet Union still existed, and uh, they had enormous problem. It was 20 years ago. Had I been told, when I was in Moscow at that time, that very soon, 20 years afterwards, there would be more billionaires in dollars in Moscow than in New York, I would have said, uh, I am dreaming, it's, uh, it's not possible. I have negotiated with China at a time where in Peking you had bicycles and Mao suits. Uh, not a single high-rise building. It was in, in 82, 30 years ago. Well, when you go in China today, again, I, I can pinch myself and say, well, is it really? It's for real or it's a dream? Uh, and uh, I could go, uh, go on and on. So you will see things that are absolutely extraordinary. And uh, of course, I would like to mention something because I computed myself the Moore law. So you have your own, of course, uh, mobile phone. <laughs> and the computing capacity that you have there is absolutely incredible. Already that mobile phone for me is Absolutely incredible. I started my, my career as an economist with an Olivetti electromechanic. <laughs> and the noise was chong, 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 chong. And then I had a correlation and I tried to do something with this correlation. The Moore law says that you, every uh, 18 months, uh, it doubles. So in 20 years' time, when you are in your vibrant 40s, <laughs> there would be 13 period of 18 months, even a little bit more, say 13. Two power 13, if I'm not misled, you could recompute, of course, should be something like 8,000. So you will have with, with you, it's exactly the same weight and dimension something that would have a computing capacity 8,000 times more than what we all have today. Reflect on the emerging properties that then would be introduced progressively. Of course, it's not a, a, a brutal and sharp change, but progressively we will see enormous changes and we see them already in our civil society, the way they function, in our political Democracy is the way they function in global finance. I'm absolutely sure that part of the emerging property we observed after Lehman are linked 
to IT and to this immediate uh, translation of all information the world over, computation capacity the world over, and capacity also to uh, have, uh, in a way which is amazing, uh, behavioral correlation at the global level. And, of course, this also will have enormous consequences on the, on the real economy. So, again, prepare for the unexpected and make the best out of what you have learned here in this uh, very vibrant uh, business school, which I have to say is very impressive because it started only a few years ago and it's already very, very visible and very well known. And, uh, again, uh, work on your own resilience because, because, again, you will have to cope with a lot of new challenges that we still have absolutely no idea about. Thank you very much for your attention.